social dinner. Uh, either uh, it will be one of the coffee breaks or during the lunch time, we are going to have a group photo. Uh, I we don't know yet uh, exactly why. Yeah, so we'll make another amount of the group photo. So this I am into the special channel again that will give us an introduction on forum. Okay, can, can you can you all hear me? No, because it's off. Can you hear me up there? Okay, cool. Uh, so good morning, everybody. Uh, so today we're gonna uh, discuss, so it's gonna be a, a third kind of theory uh, lecture. And this is gonna be expanding on the discussion we had on uh, Tuesday about uh, many body uh, theories or electron phonon physics. But today is gonna be specifically about the uh, concept of polarons, okay? So this is something that I guess uh, most of you have heard of. Uh, and uh, so I will describe it uh, in a way that I guess uh, is gonna be accessible. And then I will explain some of the problems that exist in calculating those things and some of the solutions that uh, one might consider, okay? Uh, so uh, as usual, uh, let me tell you uh, how we're gonna proceed. First, I will give you a very, very brief introduction to the kind of uh, uh, the notion of polarons in a kind of uh, uh, empirical way. Uh, then I will discuss some recent experiments on uh, something called polaron satellites, okay? And I will explain what they mean and you know why people are interested in that. Uh, then I will summarize what people do when trying to calculate uh, polarons uh, using density functional theory, uh, explain what are the, the, the challenges that one faces, and then uh, uh, we will try to solve these challenges uh, first by studying the uh, landau peccar theory of polarons, which is essentially the first model ever built of polarons in the 1940s, and then trying to uh, extend these kind of models to uh, you know, complete up initial calculations. So that's basically the plan. So polaron concept is something that uh, I'm sure uh, all of you have seen at least on Wikipedia. So the idea is that you take a crystal, uh, it's an insulator, okay? maybe a rock salt, uh, you know, a halide uh, uh, crystal, like, uh, you know, kitchen salt, sodium chloride, and uh, you add an electron to the system. So if the interaction between the electron and the atoms is very strong, uh, it could happen that the electron attracts atoms around itself, so around itself, and then these atoms cause a, a potential well. The potential well itself uh, uh, acts as a, basically as an attractor for the electron, so the, the wave function the electron localizes, right? So you basically have in this kind of cartoons a lampo charge that is sitting at some point, is not a periodic block wave, okay, that you know, we used to when we study uh, band structures. So one of the main uh, uh, consequences of that is that uh, if an electron is trapped here, you know, there will be other minima, for example, here, 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 that are all equivalent in energy, but they are separated by some kind of barrier, okay? So in other words, to, to go from here to here, the electron will have to overcome a barrier. And this is uh, uh, you know, what leads to the so-called phenomenon of uh, you know, polar hopping from one side to the other. So this is interesting because it leads to some uh, uh, qualitative new trends okay, with respect to what we have seen yesterday. Uh, so yesterday you studied mobilities of semiconductors and the resistivities of metals. So what you learn is that if you take a metal and you study the resistivity as a function of temperature, the resistivity goes up with temperature, okay? So this is the reciprocal of the conductivity, which goes down instead. And the idea is that as the, the uh, vibrational amplitudes increase, uh, the electrons feel more scattering from, uh, from the atoms. So the mobility decreases, the conductivity decreases, and the resistivity go up, okay? So this is the standard regime of diffusive transport that can be described by the Boltzmann transport equation that you've seen yesterday. So there are some systems, in this case, actually, the left uh, panel is for uh, uh, one polymorph for titanium dioxide called anatase, so this kind of structure. There are other systems, like another polymorph for, uh, of anatase called rutile, where uh, measurements indicate instead of going up, the resistivity goes down, okay? So that's completely against what we learned yesterday. So the resistivity decreases with temperature, all right? So it seems like as if the, uh, as the atoms vibrate more, the electrons can move uh, more easily through the crystal, okay? And this is actually quite interesting, and uh, it has been uh, interpreted in terms of uh, atoms uh, uh, vibrating and providing energy to, for, to the electrons to jump from one side to the other. And this is typically considered a signature of the fact that the electron is not a delocalized block wave, but is actually a localized uh, uh, lamp of charge, which people call a polaron, right? So these things are, uh, uh, you know, are observed in, in the experiments. And uh, you know, the, the, the objective of this lecture is to discuss uh, you know, not transport because it's still a little bit too difficult for us, but to interpret uh, the phenomenon of electron localization and trying to, to establish a framework to, to discuss it uh, quantitatively. 
So uh, before going there, uh, let me uh, basically go back uh, maybe 10 years and explain why people uh, have been interested in polarons uh, recently. So the uh, polaron concept is something that, uh, that uh, has been uh, uh, you know, around for almost 100 years. So there are many, many studies of that, many models, uh, many measurements in the you know, 60s, 70s, 80s. Then the interest in those things declined, all right? But in the past 10 years, there have been a very, very refined uh, and a very elegant uh, photoelectron spectroscopy experiment where people uh, suggested uh, that they have identified polarons, okay? They have really seen signatures of polarons, uh, direct signatures, and these are really uh, sparked, uh, you, know, you know, new interest in this kind of, uh, of physics. So I'm going to show you a couple of examples of that. And to, before showing that, I need to explain what is for the mission. So many of you will be familiar with that, but for those who have never seen that, so in a, a photo emission experiment, what happens conceptually, because things are much more difficult, uh, you know, complex in reality, is that one shines light on a sample, right? So this is uh, maybe a thin sample. This is uh, either a laser light or synchrotron radiation. And if the energy of the photon is uh, high enough, you might be able to extract electrons, okay? This is the Einstein's uh, photoelectric effect. Then the electrons that are extracted are uh, essentially collected into uh, uh, an analyzer. So this is a uh, two concentric uh, half spheres or MI spheres with an electric field in between. Uh, the electric field deflects trajectories and then they are, the electrons are collected you know, into a detector. So by recording the landing point of the electron, one can reconstruct the energy and the momentum of the electron prior to extraction. So in other words, this measurement gives you the complete many body band structure of, our, of systems. So this is the most direct measurement of band structure that we have today, okay? And you know, when you see pictures like this, you really realize that bus structure are not just a construct for theory. See that they are really something uh, that exists and can be measured. Now, what happens when you try to do these measurements? Uh, for example, if you take a metal, uh, uh, you know, if you have uh, something like that, you know, a parabolic, uh, you know, maybe electron gas. So these are the dispersions. So if you perform an ARPES experiments and everything goes as planned, what you should observe is something uh, looking like this uh, parabola, right? So in the next couple of slides, we'll see that that's not the case. So why, uh, uh, what happens when uh, uh, we move from the electron gas to uh, you know, incorporating uh, uh, many body interactions? So on Tuesday, we say that uh, as soon as you switch on electron uh, foreign interactions, uh, one thing happens for sure is that the electrons become a little bit heavier. So the, 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 the bands are being modified, okay? So you have something like this, right? It's not exactly the DFT bands, but it's something a little bit uh, with uh, heavier masses. Another effect that uh, we have not discussed and we're gonna discuss now, is that on top of this kind of uh, renormalization, one also observes that there is extra features in the bands that we don't see in density functional theory. So typically there are some uh, uh, extra copies of the bands. They are called satellites, sometimes photon satellites, sometimes polar on satellites. And this is the, the things that we would like to discuss now, okay? So let me uh, just uh, give you a, a couple of examples. So these are uh, photoelectron spectra for uh, uh, anatase, titanium dioxide, all right? So what are we looking at here? So this is uh, uh, an insulator in principle, but if you illuminate it, you create oxygen vacancies and that corresponds to creating electrons, basically electron doping into the system. So in practice, one is uh, exploring the bottom of the conduction band. This is, you imagine that this is uh, the conduction band bottom is a little parabola here. And then there is uh, something else below here. So this something else is basically this guy here. And then there is, uh, if you look carefully, there is also something else here. So it's not just a conduction on bottom, but there are you know, some replicas of the band, all right? So this is what has been called uh, polar on satellites. And when people came up with these measurements, essentially they say, yes, we have seen for the first time, you know, that direct signatures of, of polarons in, in these materials, all right? So this is another example. Actually, I'm putting this here because this is from one of our collaborators. It's uh, Phil King uh, St. Andrews in the UK. So he was interested in, uh, in uh, other oxide. So this is europium oxide. It's a system that uh, uh, people got interested in because it's the only uh, ferromagnetic, uh, uh, so fully spin polarized semiconductor. So what that means is that if you do a band structure calculation, for example, uh, you will notice that the valence band top and the conduction band bottom are both spin polarized with the same spin. So this is useful to you know to create spin valves and you know spin tronics. So that's just a curiosity. But let's see what happens if you do ARPES. So uh, if you perform ARPES measurements, okay, uh, you observe a first band down here. So these are the oxygen P states. So these two are friends. Then there is another band here. So these are the uh, European 4F states. So these are friends. But what one really wants to see is uh, what happens at the conduction band bottom. So to see electrons there, uh, they need to be present. Okay, otherwise you cannot extract them. So there must be electrons there. So they dope the system with gadolinium. The European has two electrons, you know, in the, in the kind of uh, free electrons and the gadolinium has three of them. So there's a little bit of electron doping here. 
There is no signal here, but it's just an, a question of intensity because when you dope, there is very, very few electrons here and a lot of electrons here. So if you remove the signal and zoom in, you, you discover that there is actually a conduction band edge, okay? So you can see here the conduction band bottom. So that would be this point here. And then there is a little bit of a bump. So this is a satellite, another satellite. And the, the message of this kind of work was, okay, yeah, we also see polarons in the case of uh, uh, europium oxide, okay? So now uh, uh, what I would like to do is to try to uh, understand how these features uh, uh, come about and with a very simple model. So I'm not gonna give you the maths and the, you know, the various formulas for this because this is not the core part of this uh, lecture. I just want to give you a very brief idea of what's going on. So you may remember that on Tuesday, uh, we, we used a very simple model, which was a parabolic electron gas, so like a free electron gas. So parabolic dispersions with one phonon, okay? Uh, dispersionless phonon, so no, 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 no uh, uh, momentum dispersion. So this is an Einstein model. And uh, with a constant electron phonon matrix element, we said, okay, one can calculate the fermion dot self energy, add it to the, 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 uh, the band structures, and you get, instead of the, the green line, so the, instead of the yellow line, which would be the free electron bands, you get something modified, which is this red line, right? So we say that the dispersions get uh, uh, modified, so in the sense that you have a change of slope. So this is uh, what we call the velocity renormalization, okay, enhancement of the velocity. There is increased broadening in this area, and so on. Okay, so these are the effects that we discussed uh, on, uh, on, uh, on Tuesday. Now, there was one implicit assumption in this model uh, uh, that I did not mention, uh, and I was cheating a little bit. So the assumption is that, uh, uh, so this is a straight line simply because you need to imagine the Fermi level is very, very far down, okay? So this is basically a parabola, but we are so close to the Fermi level that we see a straight line, okay? So the assumption was that the phonon energy is much smaller than the Fermi energy. So imagine this being 50 milli electron volts and the Fermi energy being I mean, two electron volts, okay? So these two energy scales are, are very far from each other. Now, in the examples I just mentioned, what people are looking at is a situation where you have a, a, a parabolic conduction band bottom, you add some electrons, okay? But the Fermi levels are typically of the order of 10 millivolt, 20 millivolt, 50, 100 millivolt. So this is exactly the energy scale of phonons, okay? So to describe that, one would need to, to repeat this model, but consider a situation where the phonon energy is similar to the Fermi energy. So if you do that actually, and you repeat the calculation, something interesting happened. So the, the Fermi energy in this case is, uh, you know, as uh, uh, big as this uh, kind of, uh, uh, you know, depth here in the yellow curve. So the um, the the, uh, the uh, non-interacting curve. So the phonon energy is this uh, uh, size here. And uh, as soon as you switch on electron phone interactions, on this side, you have a bending. So like here for the, the case that we discussed Tuesday, you need to imagine that also on this side, you will have some kind of bending. So now these two things that are bending inward essentially will merge in the center and they create a new band that has a, a heavier mass, but some of the spectral weight will spill over and will basically go down here, all right? So in other words, this feature here, when you have a very small Fermi energy, transforms from uh, you know, two kinks into one satellite, if you see what I mean. So this again, a manifestation of this renormalization of the bands that you know, we discussed on Tuesday, it is just specifically uh, a kind of uh, a happening to, you know, in the case where the Fermi energy and the phonon energy, they kind of resonate, all right? So that's when you see these features. So now, uh, uh, you know, having said that, uh, one could say, okay, but this seems to be some kind of band renormalization and not really the formation of a localized polaron. And indeed that is the case, okay? So this object has been called a polaron satellite, but in, in practice, uh, uh, you know, we need to be careful when we, uh, you know, give it this name because it's not exactly what one has in mind when thinking about polarons. So now just to give you an idea of how calculations perform in this case. Uh, so this is done using the fan middle self energy that uh, I showed you on, on, uh, on Tuesday. Uh, the only change with respect to those, those kind of uh, expressions is that to obtain more than one satellite, you need to use a slightly more advanced technique, which is called the cumulant expansion method. I'm not gonna go into the details because uh, uh, we don't want to, to go there, but this is just something that uh, has essentially the same computational cost as what we discussed on Tuesday. So it's not a, a, big, a, a big problem. And when you compare experiment and calculations, things are pretty good. So this is the experimental uh, conduction by bottom, okay? So if you could take a cut at this momentum, so this is the X point in the blue zone of this compound, you will find essentially the first peak, second peak, third peak that are here. First one, second one, third one. So this is what we call the quasi-particle peak, okay? Most of the spectral weight. And these are what are, we call, uh, uh, you know, phonon or polaron satellites, okay? So the important thing of the satellites is that they are separated 
uh, by the, from the quasi-particle peak by a multiple of the full energy. So this is 60 millivolt, 120 millivolt, 180 millivolt, and 60 is precisely the energy of the longitudinal optical phonon in this material, okay? So uh, if you look at the calculations then you find something similar. So this is the quasi-particle peak, first satellite, second satellite, you take a cut, and again, you find quasi-particle, satellite, satellite. So in terms of uh, kind of comparison experiment theory, things are pretty good. So there are still some uh, challenges. For example, you will notice that the size, so the intensity of the peaks are not exactly the same, but the qualitative features are, are reasonable, okay? So this is to say that these calculations can reasonably capture, you know, these uh, photo emission satellites and, you know, these uh, kind of observations of polarons in, uh, in photoelectron spectra. So now the trouble begins because uh, after uh, you, you discuss this with experimentalists and then your calculations agree with them somewhat, you know, they're happy and they ask you more questions to understand their experiments. So the first questions that we got was actually uh, 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 quite telling. So, you know, what we have in mind when we, when we see kind of, we think of polarons in density functional theory, if you have some bands, for example, and you create a polaron, we all think, oh, that's a localized state, so it's gonna be in, inside the band gap, okay? So there might be something in the band gap, like a defect. So if you look at this picture, say, okay, this is the band, or maybe this is the defect state. So that is the polaron. So the first question to us was, you know, oh, can we say that this is the polaron in the system? Well, the answer actually is no, because I just told you that this is separated from the uh, quasi-particle band by 60 millivolts, this is 120 millivolts, and so on. So it's just separated by the phonon energy. So there is no intrinsic polaron binding energy here. They are just set to phonon energy. So there's something that doesn't really, uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, match in this uh, description. The second question was, well, you know, we know that uh, uh, from solid state physics, so 101, let's say, that uh, uh, the size of things in real space uh, is essentially the, the can be obtained by the, you know, taking the spread of uh, an object in reciprocal space, like, you know, in momentum space, right? you take the, you know, the delta K, you take the reciprocal and that gives you a size in, in real space, like, right? so the more localized things in, in, in a real space, the more delocalized the reciprocal space, vice versa. So there, we've been asked, oh, can I say that this size here, so this, let's say, diameter, is something I can use to obtain the size of the polar. So can we say that, you know, the, the polar wave function, is, you know, can be determined by taking this uh, delta k here, taking the reciprocal, and that gives me, you know, maybe a large polar or something like that. And also in this case, the answer is no, you cannot do that, okay? So this is just to say that uh, there is a lot of intricacies in this uh, kind of under interpretation of polarons, and there is a lot kind of, uh, uh, you know, need for, you know, cleaning up a little bit, uh, you know, the, the, the general understanding of these things. And the way I had to, to, you know, the best way I have to, to, you know, I can come up to explain, you know, what is going on here uh, is with a cartoon. So uh, uh, what I used to explain that is the following cartoon. And you know, let me explain what that is. So what it, this is, is a cartoon model of uh, an oxide, suppose, let's say magnesium oxide, so rock salt. So you have two types of atoms. It's a big chunk of system. Imagine you're doing a, a photoelectron experiment. So shine light, an electron gets extracted, okay? So when this electron gets extracted, you know, it leaves behind a positive charge, okay? Because there are more neg positive charges from the atoms then negative charges from the electrons. So this is a hole. Now the hole is a charged particle and therefore it interacts with the you know, charged atoms nearby. And that, what can happen is essentially triggers a, a vibration wave. So this is exactly the same mechanism that you would have if you imagine you know, going home, you know, filling a bathtub, putting a rubber duck in the middle, you know, waiting a second, everything is equilibrium. Then you pull out the rubber duck and then there are some ripples in the water, okay? So that's exactly the same phenomenon. So the ripples are exactly these uh, satellites that one sees in photomission, all right? So the bottom line is that these satellites that have been called polaron satellites are not the polaron itself. These are just shake up excitations, okay? They also happen if you basically uh, trigger plasmons, if you trigger magnons and things like that. So in other words, what happens is that you remove something from the system and this change actually is triggered in some interactions and this interaction can be seen in spectroscopy, okay? So this is not the same as the image of the polaron we have in mind when we see cartoon you know, figures of the polaron, okay? And then the, the, the consequence of this is that the polaron is not this little satellite bump that you find in the middle of the gap. The polaron is the entire spectral you know, object, and in particular, the quasi-particle peak, because that's the biggest uh, component of that, uh, that spectrum, okay? So this changes a little bit the way we understand things. And uh, you know, if you follow, if you're following my reasoning, what I'm saying is that you're not gonna find something in the middle of the gap, okay? your band bottom is already the polar, right? So that's the, the kind of change of perspective one has to adopt to, to understand polarons. 
So the other thing that comes out out of this uh, uh, you know, reasoning is that uh, from this uh, uh, spectral analysis, you cannot obtain the wave function depolar. Okay, so these things uh, like uh, many body methods, uh, spectral functions are good to look at density of states, are good to, to plot uh, kind of spectra and compare with experiments, but you're not gonna get localized uh, wave functions, all right? So one needs to use uh, uh, alternative methods to do that. So let's see uh, what, uh, you know, one would like to really to achieve and know how to, to kind of implement these kind of ideas that uh, people were already discussing in 1940s. So this is again a cartoon where you have a, a field valence band, empty conduction band, could be a semiconductor, could be an insulator. Uh, so here the dots represent the atoms, and this is the, the crystal potential. So let's say the self-consistent potential in DFT. So now, uh, so let's say we are in the ground state, and now I add one electron to the system. So the electron cannot occupy the valence because it's already full, so it has to go in the conduction. If I minimize the energy, it's gonna sit in the conduction band bottom, obviously. And at this point, the, 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 uh, since it's a block wave, uh, the, the, the square modulus of the wave function has to be periodic, okay? So if you do a DFT calculation, you add an electron in your unit cell, you will find exactly this kind of scenario, right? So this, in this uh, situation, the atoms maintain their equilibrium position, so we're not changing anything there. So one could do now a thought experiment and say, suppose I repeat this calculation in a supercell, and uh, uh, just to see what happens, I move some atoms, maybe this one goes a little bit towards the center, this one gets moved, this one gets moved, a little localized distortion, and I keep the atoms frozen in that position, and I relax the electrons again, okay? So you take quantum espresso, you do a supercell, you do this operation, and you, you look for the electron wave function. So what could happen is that the electron becomes some kind of a, a localized object because now there is a potential well, and if it's localized, well, something happens, so this cannot be a block wave, so it cannot belong to the conduction band, so it has to be somewhere in the middle of the gap, okay? So now this kind of phenomenon is what people had in mind when they were talking about uh, you know, polarons uh, many years ago, right? And if you think about it, this is much closer to standard DFT calculations than to spectroscopic uh, kind of calculations to interpret for the, met for the electron spectrum, okay? So this is basically to say that uh, 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 when you discuss polarons, maybe uh, you know the best starting point is not to go with Green's functions as what I was discussing on, on Tuesday, but to just use a plain old simple density functional theory and do a calculation and see what happens, all right? So in principle, what this means is that you, know, you, you, know, you want to ask, uh, you know, is there a polar in titanium dioxide? You take a supercell, you add an electron and see what happens. So that's exactly what people have been doing actually for quite a few years now. So this is an example for uh, uh, lithium peroxide. So this is, uh, in this work, the others, uh, they, they took lithium peroxide. So it's just uh, an oxide that you, know, you can find in some kind of battery applications and things like that. And uh, if you um, uh, find, so if you have an electron and you keep the atoms in place, like in the equilibrium positions, this electron is completely delocalized, all right? Now, if you make this change, you distort the atoms in some region, okay? And then you relax the electron, and then you let everything go, you look for the minimum. In this case, you find something similar to the cartoon I showed you. Actually, there is a localization of the wave function around some place, all right? So notice that here there is no uh, crystal defects, okay? So it's a pristine crystal, it's just that uh, there is another solution that is not delocalized, but it is localized, all right? So one could say, okay, that's it. You know, this is the way to look for polarons. Um, now, what we're gonna discuss now is what are the problems with this kind of uh, uh, description? So uh, the, the first problem is that uh, uh, if you try to do this calculation as I just described, usually you don't get anything. So you just get the localized solution. Because, you know, for example, we're used to maybe do calculations, first point to call, I don't know, PB in terms of exchange correlation, you do PB, there is no localization, you find a delocalized state. Then you say, okay, maybe I'm gonna try the old, good old LDA. So I try LDA, no localization. And then you try other things, still no localization. Then at some point it's okay, let's go uh, pay a little bit more uh, kind of uh, uh, you know, expensive calculation. So you try hybrids. Maybe the, you know, with a standard uh, hybrid, no localization. But if you crank up the exchange and correlation fraction, at some point you start seeing something localized, all right? So what you discover in practice is that uh, the degree of localization and the energetics of this object depend on your exchange and correlation fraction. And don't depend a little bit. They depend, uh, you know, a lot on this number. So this is the first problem. So the second problem is that, you know, in this example, so there is a polar which sits maybe in a three by three by three supercell. Okay, so this is doable. Suppose now a material like that had a polar on which was maybe not just a couple of orbitals, but four, five, six orbits, like a lump of charge covering five, six atoms. Well, if you place in a three, three, three supercell, this will overlap with the neighbors and it will delocalize. Okay, so if you don't find a polar in DFT, does it mean that the system does not have a polar or it means that your supercell is not big enough, right? 
So one has to essentially needs a method where you can explore a very large supercells to make sure that size effects are not affecting your, your, your calculation of polarizer. So that's the second problem. So for the first problem, uh, people have been thinking about solutions actually. Uh, so this is actually a, a, a reasonably a recent work by this is the group of uh, uh, Patrick Rink and, and Matthias Schaeffer in, in Berlin, where they were looking at problems like that. And for example, this, uh, uh, they looked at the magnesium oxide, they remove an electron, and you see this is a, uh, the, the localized polar wave function, and this is a hybrid functional calculation. Now, the plot on the right gives you the binding energy versus the fraction of exact exchange. Binding energy means the following. If the number is positive, the delocalized ground state is more stable. So there is no polar. If this number is negative, so in this region, the polar is more stable than the delocalized solution. So you do have a localization, all right? So what you can see basically is that as you move the, the fraction exact exchange from this side to this side, you know, the, the, you go from a no polar and no polar and no polar. At some point uh, you hit the zero, they are equally uh, stable and then polar and polar and polar. So it's a complete dependence on this, uh, on this uh, uh, fraction, which is an, uh, uh, you know, uh, adjustable parameter in a way. So what they propose in this work is to, you know, that one could use uh, Koopman's, uh, uh, you know, conditions like the ones that Nicola Marzari was discussing on Monday to decide what should be uh, your uh, fraction exact exchange. So this is one way to, to go about this problem. And, uh, uh, you know, this is something that uh, one can do certainly. Uh, the, the problem that remains is that, uh, you know, you can certainly afford that for a very small polar. Okay, so if you do MGO and the polar is a couple of orbitals, yes, you can do hybrids. Suppose your polar is a little bit bigger and you need a supercell with maybe 5,000, 10,000 atoms. So you cannot do a hybrid calculation in that case. Okay, so we are stuck. So what we've been thinking about in the past few years is that the, what is the actual problem in DFT calculation of this type and how to fix it, all right? So what I want to do now is to give you the solution that uh, we, we are proposing and then you know, we can discuss, uh, you know, what do you think about it maybe. So to, to come to you know, this kind of solution, what we did is to do something very simple. Uh, we, we basically forgot all we knew and we went back to the literature you know, down to the 1940s to understand how the first people who discussed polarons thought about this problem. And this actually is the model of Landau and Pekar. That, you know, it's a, essentially a beautiful model because it can solve, be solved by you know, paper and pencil and, uh, and uh, it has a lot of physics inside it. So what I would like to do now is to explain so how this model works. And if you follow me, it's going to be just the three or four equations, and you will see it's really very elegant. Okay. And the interesting thing is that this model captures a lot of uh, what we see in ab initial calculations already. So clearly, at the time, they didn't have computers and didn't have uh, uh, you know any uh, advanced algorithms. They didn't have uh, many body physics. Uh, so what they, they they consider is a very simple system where uh, you know uh, maybe a, a, a you know uh, a halide salt could be described as a polar insulator. So this is basically a continuum. Right, a polarizable continuum where you have a dielectric constant uh, associated with the electrons and dielectric constant associated with electrons plus nuclei. Okay, epsilon infinity, epsilon zero. There is a uniform material with uniform screening, no atoms. Okay, and then what you want to do is to see what happens if you add an electron. So now it, to discuss some kind of uh, uh, wave functions, the electron has to be a quantum object. Okay, so what uh, they had in mind is the following uh, uh, Hamiltonian, or if you want, uh, this is the classical, so it's semi classical, so it's a total energy. This contains two pieces. One is the kinetic energy of this electron. Okay, take the wave function, square, you know, gradient, square modulus. This is kinetic energy, and there's an effective mass here to say that you know, uh, uh, you know, the, the kinetic energy will depend on, on the specific mass structure of this compound. And then there is a, a, a electrostatic energy, which is uh, the standard, uh, you know, energy density of the electromagnetic field uh, integrated uh, inside the, the uh, uh, this volume. And what this represents is the following. If I add an electron, this is a positive charge, so I electric charge. This polarizes the lattice, and that will carry some kind of uh, electrostatic energy. All right. So this is a term that's to enter in the, in the energy as well. So uh, uh, this uh, per se is not very useful because we really want to find maybe the energy of this object. We want to find the wave function, but we don't know how, what to do with that. So what they did is an extremely simple reasoning that you can propose to you know second year undergraduates, and that is the following. So we know that the displacement field is related to the density of free carriers, okay? So what are the free carriers in this case? Well, it's the extra electron that I'm adding. So what they did is to say, well, the divergence of this displacement is just the square modulus of the wave function that, of the electron I'm adding. And then how do I uh, uh, treat the electric field? Well, I can say the displacement is proportional to the electric field via the electric constants. So these two relations you know, are sufficient to rewrite this integral simply in terms of the wave function. In fact, if you uh, try to rewrite this as, a, as an integral, you obtain that the displacement uh, is something that uh, uh, has the form of a uh, Hartree potential, okay? 
And then when you take the scalar product of the electric field, you find some kind of Hartree energy. So in practice, this electrostatic terms become something where you have the wave function, the wave function, and their distance you know, in a Coulomb potential. So in other words, they managed to rewrite these electrostatic terms simply in terms of the wave functions and in terms of the screening in this material. Okay? So that's really, really simple. So now the screening comes from the, uh, uh, you know, both the electrons and the nuclei. So that's why there's a one over the static dielectric constant. However, uh, there is a little bit of double counting and they knew about that at, the, at this point because the electronic screening has already been incorporated when uh, saying that the electrons are basically renormalized. Okay, so this effect of effective mass is, uh, is uh, uh, really an, a renormalization of the, of the electrons by the, by, the, uh, you know, by the other electrons. So to take this into account, what they did is to subtract you know, the, the screen coming from the electrons, and this would be the effect associated with the, only with the ions in the system, all right? So now, by replacing this object here, one obtain an energy that depends only on this wave function, and this wave function here, and this one here, so you have an energy functional of the wave function, right? And that's like in the FT, so you want an energy functional, what do you do? Uh, you, you try to find the minimum, so you take a derivative with respect to the wave function, and you obtain some equation, right? So if you do this derivative, you land into an expression that looks like this, and it's basically kinetic energy, some kind of potential here, then Eggenmile times wave function. So this is what is called the landau pekar equation, right? It's again a semi-classical model, quantum electron continuum screening, and then uh, you, know, you land into a non-linear Eggenmile problem. Non-linear because it's a wave function here, the, the cube of the wave function here, okay? So this is like a Schrodinger's equation, but a little bit uh, uh, you know, more complicated. And actually, if you think about this carefully, this is very similar to what happens in density functional theory. Density functional theory, the heart and the exchange correlation are quadratic functions. So basically, they have the square models of the wave functions, and then they are multiplied by wave function, the constant equations. So also in the case, you have a cubic term in the, in the actual kind of equation. So this is very close to DFT, all right? So let's see uh, how this works you know, using an example. So uh, uh, what one could do at this point is that, so these parameters are given, so one can try a numerical solution. That's actually quite easy. You can set a Python script and try to solve it. There is an easier way to understand the physics, and that's the following. Let's assume a shape for the wave function, okay? So what I'm gonna assume is that the wave function is just a decaying exponential, and then the, the, uh, we're gonna minimize the energy uh, uh, you know, with respect to the size of this wave function, okay? So the, the elegant way to say that is that we try for a variational solution, it has the shape of an exponential, and the variational parameter is the size, right? And then we write the, the, the energy that results from that. So I decided my function looks like this. So it's basically just an exponential. I replace the expression in the previous equation, okay? And what I obtain is two terms. So the energy is gonna be the sum of two bits. One is a, uh, a kinetic part. So we had kinetic and electrostatic. So the kinetic part turns out to be very simply uh, one divided the size uh, of the, uh, this function to the power of two, okay? One over the square of the size of the wave function. So this is the plot, uh, it's pretty trivial, but the point is that you minimize this energy by making this function as delocalized as possible. So kinetic delocalized the particle, the, the, this function. There was a second term, which was electrostatic. It turns out that that is very simple as well. It's just a prefactor times one divided the size of the function with a minus sign. So in this case, it's the red line. So to minimize the electrostatic part, you want the function to be as localized as possible, okay? Very, very small. So since these two things have the opposite signs and they go to zero with different uh, kind of uh, 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 rates, there must be a minimum in this expression. In fact, if you add them up, you find a function that looks like a you know, standard, like Lennard Jones potential, things like that. What that means is that if this is the delocalized solution, so this uh, horizontal line, there is a situation where you may have solutions that are more stable, so energetically more favorable, and this is the localization of the polar, okay? So in practice, uh, the minimum is here, and what this means is that in this kind of calculation, there will be a, a radius that minimizes this energy, and that gives you something that is not a, a block wave, but it's something that has a certain finite size, all right? <laughs> So at that time, they already essentially pointed out that there is a possibility of electron localization. So uh, what does this depend upon? Uh, if you look at the model, actually, there are only three parameters. Uh, uh, the electric constant of the electrons, uh, static dielectric constant, electrons plus ions, and the effective mass. So in other words, there are regions of phase space for these parameters that make the solution uh, 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 possible and then decide the size of the polar. Okay, and this was a model and the, the interesting bit that this model is still very much used today to interpret, um, you know, actual polarons in, in, in experiments. 
So let me just uh, give you now a, a little bit of a, a background on how people talk about these things. So I told you there are three parameters, okay? So the electric constant, the effective masses, people like to, to basically put together this parameter in a single number. Uh, and this single number is called the uh, polar uncoupling constant, okay? The, 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 the reason for doing this is that it is a dimensionless number and uh, uh, you know, it's a very compact descriptor and uh, usually things scale with this number. For example, the polar on energy, so the, the, the formation energy, uh, in, at least in some models, it's uh, either proportional or proportional to the square of this number. So if you have this number at hand, you can already make estimates about uh, you know, polar on physics. And this is just a table to show you that uh, for a, a number of compounds, this value ranges uh, somewhere between zero and six for these cases. Uh, actually, uh, 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 Chao Lian, one of, uh, you know, basically who ran the tutorial on, on polarons today, he also found that using direct calculations that there are you know, compounds with much larger values between 10, 20, and things like that. And just for a kind of uh, a general knowledge, in the polaron literature, people distinguish more or less three regions. The weak coupling regime, where basically this number is around zero, okay? Usually people uh, say that in this regime, you can use perturbative methods like the ones that we discussed on Tuesday. Then there is an intermediate coupling, which is, uh, you know, with this parameters around uh, kind of uh, in the range of six to 10. And this is basically a, a, a regime, which is basically a, a no man's land. Nobody knows really what to do in that case. And then there is a strong coupling regime uh, where the, you know, the alpha values are very large. And in that case, these methods that I just described like the land operator equation are very accurate and actually they are, uh, you know, quite well justified, okay? So this is to, just to give you an idea of where these things are. And to connect to what we say uh, on Tuesday, so this polar uncoupling constant is actually a friend or a relative, if you want, of the electron phone uncoupling constant we discussed on Tuesday, okay? There is this kind of relation. They're not the same, but they are related, okay? They are kind of similar. Uh, so one of the uh, uh, key implications of this polar uncoupling constant alpha is that the size of the polar will depend on, uh, on alpha. Essentially, it's inversely proportional to, to this value. In other words, uh, what happens is that for large alpha, you have a small polar, and for small alpha, you have a very large polar. So the implication of this is that, uh, uh, you know, in most materials, you can try and calculate an alpha, and you will get a number. So with this kind of simple estimates, you can estimate the size of the polar. So you know, I could take gallium arsenide and say, okay, what is the polar size? You know, I could use that and, and say something about it. Probably in gallium arsenide, this number would be something of the order of maybe 500 nanometers, right? So if you have a polar, which is 500 nanometers, probably that's even si bigger than the size of your sample when you do measurements. And uh, it, it doesn't really make sense to talk about localization, okay? So in that case, the block description is totally fine. So there is no need to make any changes to what we already know. So when this number is very low, when the polar size is the order of the unit cell or a few unit cells, in that case, you know, one has to change the description that you know, we're used to and take into account, you know, this kind of size effects. So now uh, what I would like to, to show you in the, you know, in the next uh, kind of few slides is uh, you know, how we, we thought about adapting the concepts coming from the landau picard model to density functional theory calculations without uh, you know, uh, making arbitrary assumptions, okay? Trying to keep everything as ab initial as we can. And to do that, uh, essentially, uh, I'm gonna drive you, you know, kind of lead you through a couple of equations which are really elementary. And uh, if you think about it, it's something that is not really new, but it turns out to be uh, quite useful for calculating polarons. So you know that this is the, the, the total energy in density functional theory. We're all used to that. We've seen it on Monday and uh, you know, uh, already. Kinetic energy of the occupied wave functions, hard three energy, exchange correlation energy, then uh, the uh, electron to ion potential, and then the uh, ion ion repulsion, right? So we all know this very well by, by this point. Suppose now this is an insulator and I add an electron to the system, okay? So this will be into the conduction manifold somewhat. So I can rewrite this, uh, uh, this, this, uh, this expression by considering my density will have an extra wave function. So psi will be the polar, or let's say the extra electron could be a polar on a delocalized electron. And the atoms will be displaced a little bit from equilibrium, right? So that's just a bookkeeping of what would happen. If I replace these two expressions inside this equation, uh, I find the following, kinetic energy, acquires an extra term, which is for the polar. The hard three energy acquires two changes basically into the density. So density plus extra wave function, density plus extra wave function. Exchange correlation energy also acquires an extra bit in the wave function. So that's all uh, simple. Then in the electron ion potential, the, the density of the electrons acquires an extra term. And the positions of the atoms now change. They go from the original position to maybe something a little bit different. So that you will be the displacement. And also the ion-ion interaction has this displacement here and here, right? 
So if you think about it, there is nothing different from what you already know from density functional theory. We're just rewriting the equations under the condition that there's an X electron and the atoms might have moved a little bit. So at this point, what we did to proceed, because this is nothing else than DFT, and it had all the problems that I mentioned about, uh, before about DFT. So we need to do some adjustment to this expression. So the first adjustment is that uh, uh, we uh, want to use the language of phonons. So this is a school of electron phone interactions. There is the word phonon in the school title. So phonons are useful, not just because you know, it's a cool name, but because it's a useful mathematical instrument. To introduce phonons here, you need to perform a Taylor expansion to second order displacements. So that allows you to introduce phonons, okay? So what we do is to rewrite these expressions by just retaining the second order uh, uh, you know, of all of it in the atomic displacements, okay? So you do a Taylor expansion in terms of U and you keep terms up to U square. Clearly you neglect some stuff, okay? But that is you know, the price to pay to, to obtain this kind of equations. The second thing I want to mention is that, you know, if you remember a few slides ago, I said that there is a problem of the uh, 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 you know coming with the, the electron interacting with itself in density functional theories in dependence of the on the exchange correlation. So in density functional theory, uh, uh, you know we have a problem uh, because when you place an electron in an orbital, the Hartree potential includes contribution from that electron onto itself. So you can see that here. So I add an electron. This is my wave function. Well, I will have a term which is psi square times psi square divided the distance. So what is happening is that I'm saying that this electron has to interact with itself, which is a kind of a nonsense, of course. So this is what we call the self-interaction problem of DFT. And what we want to do is to eliminate this problem. So what one would like to do is to do something called a self-interaction corrected density functional theory. So if you ever looked at papers about that, you will know that there is a problem with those uh, techniques for the following reason. When you try to do self-interaction correction, you need to decide on which orbitals you're gonna calculate the, the correction. But when you make the decision, the formalism is no longer independent of the representation. So you could do, for example, one functions, but maybe it will depend on what type of one function you found, okay, or local orbitals, but it's a choice. So the only way to make this choice in median with respect to the choice of basis is to basically symmetrize the formalism, but unfortunately that leads exactly to Hartree fog, okay, which is not what we want because that would lead to very large band gaps. It's not exactly you know, what is good for, for solids and all that. So there is not, so far, there's not been a good way to do self-interaction self correction density functional theory. That's why people don't use that kind of technique so much. The case of polarons is a little bit special because uh, uh, it's, it, you know, what we are trying to do is to consider a completely filled valence band and that an electron to the conduction, okay? Or the opposite, completely filled valence band and you remove an electron. So what, is happened, what happens in that case is that there are specific orbital that we can target and that which is separated from the others by a band gap, okay? So there is no issue with making the, the theory rotational invariant because there is only one orbital that we need to discuss, all right? So in that case, the self-interaction correction is trivial and in what it consists, it consists in basically taking out the term here that corresponds to this product, so the product of this guy with this guy. So if you just eliminate this term from this expression, you have achieved a self-interaction correction for the Hartree potential. You can do the same thing for the exchange correlation. I'm not going to give the details, but it's quite easy to do. So what I'm trying to say is that when you study a single electron added or removed from a system, self-interaction correction is easy and is well-defined and it can be uh, uh, kind of used, all right? So that's the other change that we made. So if you do these two changes and then you subtract the energy of the complete delocalized state, you land into an expression, which actually is very simple. This would be the formation energy of your extra electron. It contains, uh, the uh, uh, expectation value of your wave function on the Kohn Hamiltonian, a linear interaction between the wave function and the atomic displacement, so change of Kohn potential times the displacement, and then a quadratic energy penalty that has to do with the fact that if you move atoms, there are springs that want to bring them back to the equilibrium, and then you have to pay energy if you displace them. Okay, so this essentially is a new energy function that now contains only the wave function, the polar, and the displacements, right? So, but again, if you have an energy function, what is the first thing that you do? Well, you try to find a minimum. To find a minimum, you minimize it with respect to the variational parameters. In this case, the parameters are the wave function here and the displacement of the polar, okay? So you take derivatives of this object with respect to the wave function and with respect to the, the, the displacement, and what you end up with is two equations, okay? That are very similar to what we already know. For example, the first line is uh, the Kohn-Sham equation, except that we have an extra term here. So if you remove this term, for example, if you set the displacement to zero, you recover just the Kohn-Sham equation, and this would be the conduction band bottom eigenvalue that you find in a band structure calculation. 
So when you admit the possibility that atoms may move, there is an extra term popping up, and this term may actually alter your wave function. So what are the displacement? Well, the displacement are linked to the wave function self-consistently. So they are expressed by this object here. So displacement will be the density coming from this extra electron modulated by the change of the potential. And then there is this term, which is the dynamical matrix. So the, let's say the matrix of force constants, so what you, uh, Paolo Gianotti discussed on Monday. And this is what decides you know, how each atom moves in response to an extra electron. For example, if the electron is very localized, the atoms near this electron will, will feel the most of this localization and then they will uh, displace accordingly, okay? So basically what to, uh, this uh, amounts to doing is to having a nonlinear, self-consistent, a game value problem that might give you the uh, wave function and the displacement, right? So this approach fixes the first problem I was mentioning. So the self-interaction problem, okay? So as a result, these results and do not depend on the choice of exchange correlation function. I mean, they will depend in the sense that, you know, as usual, the lattice parameters and various things will be a little bit different, but you will not find a dependence on the exchange correlation fraction or uh, yes, polar or no polar on if you change function, okay? Because that problem has been fixed. This expression, however, does not fix the second problem. Suppose you have a, a system where the polar is maybe five nanometers. So describe that, you will need a supercell, which is maybe, you know, 10,000, 20,000 atoms, all right? So you cannot do that because you know, the wave function here would have to span very many unit cells and that's too expensive. So at this point, uh, uh, you know, the idea was very simple is that, well, why do you need to work in real space? This is actually just a waste of uh, resources. So we can just keep in mind that the wave functions or any function in real space can be expanded in a complete orthonormal basis. So what is the most uh, kind of obvious basis in this case? Well, we do bus structure calculations, but it's gonna be the block function. So you take constant states, the psi nk, can be your basis. So instead of working with this uh, representation, one can say, okay, my wave function is a linear combination of block states. And uh, you know, if I choose my coefficients uh, uh, you know, um, uh, properly, I can describe any function here, right? So this is uh, not a, a new step, it's just a change of uh, point of view. And that means that instead of looking for the wave function, look for the coefficient of the wave function. Now, the interesting bit is that you can do exactly the same operation for displacement. So if I had the atomic displacement, this can be written as a linear combination of uh, phonon eigen modes. Okay, and again here, it means that I'm, I'm looking now for the coefficients and not for the, for the displacement themselves. So the beauty of this is that if you now replace these two expressions inside the equation I gave you at the end of the, of the last slide, you will find a linear, so a non-linear eigenvalue problem again, but this time the ingredients are very easy and you don't need to use large supercells. So what are the ingredients here? So the output would be the A coefficients, okay, for the electron wave function, the B coefficients for the displacements, and then the eigen value that it will be for the polar on itself. What is the input? Well, it's the band structure, it is the phonon dispersions, and it's the electron phonon matrix elements, okay? So these are the three kind of ingredients that you've been playing with throughout the week, for example, using one interpolation and all these things, okay? So now these things are very widely available, so you can just uh, take them, put them together, and try to solve this linear system and see what happens, okay? So now the problem of the large supercell is completely gone, because this calculation of mass structure, phonons, and electroformatic cells are unit cell calculations. So you don't need to worry about large cells, right? So what is the size in the system? What is the supercell? So you see here, you have some uh, wave vectors, so a summation over k points. Suppose I use a grid of 10 by 10 by 10 points. What this really means is that I'm using, I'm deciding my wave function is periodic over 10 by 10 by 10 supercell. And uh, you know, that will be the size of the maximum you know, polar I, I can observe. All right, but it's not something that it makes my calculation more expensive because it's all embedded into a k-point summation. So this is basically an example that I just want to show for what happens if you take lithium fluoride and you add an electron. And this is what we will see in, in the afternoon with the tutorials, okay? So suppose I, I, I try a, a finding a polaron in a seven by seven by seven U, uh, supercell of lithium fluoride, okay? Simple rock salt structure, so not, no problem. So if you solve this, uh, this again value problem, there is no localized solution. So you land into exactly the conduction man bottom and you have a delocalized block wave, so nothing new. Then you do an eight by eight by cell, and again, no polar. Nine, 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 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10. So at that point you hit 12, 12, 12, and you do find actually some eigen matters that are below zero, so below the conduction man bottom, and those, if you look at the wave function, oops, it's localized at this point. Okay, it's no longer a block function, it's a, it's a localized object. And then you keep increasing the size and you discover that the energy of the polar keeps drifting, okay? And this at the, at the beginning, you know, it could be a surprise, but actually it is not. And I'm gonna explain why. 
And at some point, you know, if you have an infinite supercell, it hits a number, which is in this case, for example, you know, the energy would be maybe 0.2 electromoles. So it's 0.2 electromoles more stable than the delocalized state. So what is uh, the, region, uh, the reason for this kind of trend? Actually, it is quite uh, intuitive. So I told you that if you choose a, a, a brillouin zone sampling, basically you will have a, you know, a, a periodic supercell effectively where you're placing your polaron. So if you do 777, uh, you know, maybe this supercell would be seven by seven here. Your polaron uh, may be sitting in the supercell. If the polaron is larger than the supercell size, well, there will be its replica here that will overlap with it. So you form bonding antibonding orbitals combinations and essentially starts delocalizing, okay? So since they are interfering, uh, you will obtain a delocalized object. So in order to localize, what has to happen is that the supercell is large enough to contain entirely the polar, so it does not overlap with the neighbors, okay? So this is what happens, in, uh, what happens at this point in practice. So at this point, you, you can form localized objects because they're not touching and interfering, overlapping with the neighbors, all right? So actually, if you go back to standard textbooks, this is exactly what happens in the metal to insulator transition, okay? So if you look at the MOT model of the insulator transition, you have defects. Each defect carries some kind of uh, uh, defect wave function. When there is so many of those, this defect wave function overlap and you start filling up the, the conduction bands in a, in a semiconductor, for example. So in fact, if you look at the, at the MOT criterion, so this uh, kind of line you know, uh, uh, is uh, in a good agreement with the kind of criterion, okay? So even in the world of polarons, even if the system wants to localize uh, you know, intrinsically the electrons, there will be at some point a density of electrons at which you can no longer localize because uh, you know, they, they tend to form a, a Fermi C in practice, okay? So, and just to give you an idea of how these things look, so this is the electron polar and lithium fluoride. So this is the, the, the atomic lattice and this is the shape of the wave function. So in this case, basically you have, a, I think it's maybe 10 unit cells along this line. So each unit cell is maybe three, three and a half angstrom. So this is a, maybe a three nanom nanometers as a size of polar. No? So this is what people would call a large electron polar no? in this material, okay? And if you were to do a calculations with DFC, imagine that you, you can solve the set interaction problem, maybe use a hybrid functionals. So this will require approximately 10,000 atoms, okay? So there is no chance you know, one can do that in practice. So there's also uh, the other case, which is, uh, you know, this is from the conduction, but what happens if I take out an electron from the valence? Maybe something else happens. Well, you can imagine that the valence will have heavier effective masses. So maybe more localized polarons. And indeed, uh, 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 so I'm gonna show you that. Indeed, that's exactly what happens. So this is again, the structure of the crystal. And now the polaron in the valence is exactly, you know, a couple of uh, unit cells, you know, in terms of size. So this is what one would call a small hole polaron in, in these materials, okay? So in the same crystal, add an electron or remove an electron, you, you have completely different phenomenology, okay? So what you one could expect is that for the electron polaron, these all ideas of transport, which is either diffusive or of hopping transport. So well, we could think of diffusive transport because electron is very delocalized. And for the holes, you would think about hopping transport because this really is sensitive to where you are you know, uh, in the unit cell, okay? So that's basically the other example. And the last thing I want to, to mention about that is that uh, you know, with these coefficients, you, know, you don't need to see them just as uh, uh, instruments to, to, you know, to calculate the polar wave function. You can also, so since each of them represents the weight of each block wave in the polar, you can try to plot them and try to analyze where your polar comes from so in the case of adding an electron to, to, to this material, so lithium fluoride, what happens is that if you analyze the coefficients, you discover that uh, they are mostly localized around the conduction band bottom. So if you have ever done calculations uh, of Bethe's Peter equation for accidents, you will see that this is very similar to that case. When you have a you know, large accident, the, the, the amplitudes of the accident wave functions will localize near the band extrema, and this is what happens for the large polar in, in lithium fluoride, okay? For the phonons, you can look at similar uh, uh, questions. And basically in this case, you discover that uh, phonons around the gamma points or long wavelength, in this case, the highest phonon mode, so this is the longitudinal optical mode, are the, you know, give the most weight to the polar on this distortion. And in this case, there's a little bit of component from piezoacoustic mode. And this is because this is a polar material where polar uh, Frohlich electron phone interaction are the strongest, okay? In other materials, what you find is other contributions, but you know, that depends on the material. So the, the, the beauty of this in a way is that you don't need to assume that certain phonons or certain mechanisms are dominant and then study those. You basically calculate your polar, you analyze, and this, the calculation tells you what you're looking at, okay? What kind of polarons you're looking at and you know, what are the main phonons involved. So you don't need to put this information from the, from the outset. 
And the, the, the implications of these things is that also the energies of these particles are uh, pretty much uh, pretty different from standard DFT. So this is basically uh, 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 just a cartoon representation. So it should not be a kind of this is somewhat on a, an abuse of notation, but this is just to say that if you add an electron here and you take and then you let it localize, it will be 0.2 electron volts more stable than the localized solution. Okay, that's maybe two tenths of a volt is not that big. But if you do the same for a hole, you find an energy difference of two electron volts. Okay, so this has really big implications on the band gap renormalization of these compounds. Okay, so on Tuesday, we discussed band gap renormalization, temperature dependent band structures. In those theories, the possibility that electrons localize is not taken into account at all. Okay, and here we see that when you include localization, there are very big changes to, to you know, electronic properties. So one could ask, should I use the methods of Tuesday or should I look for polarons when studying band, you know, band gaps of material and compare it to experiment? Should I merge them in some way? Is one more accurate than the other? Well, actually, uh, this is a very kind of complex question. And actually, uh, John Lafuente Bartolome, who is uh, going to help you with the tutorial this afternoon, has been working on that. But you know, you know, this is still something in progress and it's a little bit too premature to discuss. So I will leave you just with the thought that you know, this localization changes electronic structure considerably. So one has to be a little bit careful when compared to, to experiment. And then the, the last thing I want to show you is that uh, just to, to rationalize my statement that exchange and correlation is important if you don't remove the self-interaction, okay? So I say that if you do the FT calculation brute force with polarons, and then it depends on the exchange correlation fraction and uh, you don't know what you're getting. So why is this happening? So to explain that simply, I want to use the Pekar model again, so the now Pekar equation. So this is exactly the thing I, I gave you before. When they did this work, density functional theory did not exist, okay? So they never thought about self-interaction problem because they, there was no self-interaction problem at the time. So let's imagine that today we wanted to, to build a, a Landau-Picard model, but uh, we were born with density functional theory. We learned about uh, you know, the kind of strategies. So we write the Landau-Picard energy, including the self-interaction problem, because you know, that's how we are used to. So what would happen is that there would be an extra term in the expression where the electron wave function interacts with itself in a Hartree term. Okay? So this would be the Hartree self-interaction. Right? So this would be a DFT modified Landau-Pekar equation. Now, if you look at these expressions, this object here and this object here look the same, right? And if you look at these uh, prefactors, this is the same to this, uh, this object here. So you can combine basically this parenthesis with the one here. So if you do that in practice, you obtain a, a similar term, but now the prefactor, if you look at the numbers, is something that is between minus one and zero, okay? There is no other choice because of the values that the epsilon infinity epsilon zero can take. So this term is always negative. That means since there's a minus sign that this term here is always positive. So when I show you the two curves, so attraction and the kinetic energy, the attraction part was localized the polarum, but in this case, this is delocalized the polarum because now the curve is positive. So that means that if you incorporate self-interaction in the landau pekar equation, the, the, there are no solutions that are localized. So the only, so the minimum energy corresponds to an infinitely large uh, electron. So basically a fully delocalized block wave. So adding self-interaction to landau pekar equation kills the polar. If you do hybrid functionals, what that is doing is to partially compensate for this self-interaction. In fact, what that would be equivalent to is to add the parameter here where you tune down a little bit this term. And that means that uh, this term here will maybe be positive, but it will depend on your exchange collision fraction, okay? So this is why when you do calculation with hybrids, you can get all the results you want because basically you are tuning the size of this object, all right? And that is the problem. And it's a really a fundamental problem. And if it is not dealt with, one cannot be predictive in studying polarons, okay? So that's just to say a, a warning in, in, in studying these problems. So this is the conclusion. I just want to say, uh, just to recap. So we started from RPS measurements. Those are looking at phonon shake up satellites. So they are sometimes called polarons, but they're not really you know, what we mean by polaron, like a localized object. Second, if you try to do DFT, uh, uh, there is a self-interaction problem that is major, a major problem. It cannot be circumvented very easily and it will make the calculations not predictive, okay? And uh, uh, what I tried to basically uh, uh, show you in the last few slides is that you know, there are ways uh, to combine perturbation theory with the density functional theory to get something that is now uh, immune from these kind of problems. And this is what you're gonna work on during the afternoon, right? So this is uh, some references. I just want to mention that there is uh, some classic reference, for example, this by, by Joseph de Vries, who is, uh, keeps updating the archive with the, you know, new findings on polarons. So that's actually very instructive and that's where we learn most of what we know. 
the, the review article by Franchini and collaborators in Vienna, it tells you all that there is to know about experiments on polarons up to, up to last year. And then there are several, several other references that is worth checking, all right? So this is the end of the lecture. Thank you for the attention. Thank you, Felicia. Very nice talk. Questions. Yeah, so thank you for a great presentation. Uh, so I have one question. So in case of polarons, uh, have there been any signatures that uh, show that uh, there are strong non-ideality effects? And what could be the limitations of uh, the this DSP like approach uh, that uh, we could be missing, and uh, what are the limitations of that? Uh, yeah, so there are many limitations in the sense that this is a, a DFT based approach. So, it, so if you remember what we said on uh, the introductory lecture on Monday, DFT has classical ions and uses the born oppenheimer approximation. So these, approx these limitations are inherited by this approach, obviously. So what one has to do is to try to go beyond those. And that requires essentially trying to go back towards a many body greens function format. Okay, so this is something that uh, John has been working on actually, and uh, but it's still a work in progress, let's say. So there is a lot, so this is not the, let's say it's not the final word. There is a lot to do in a way, we see this as the beginning of something enabling these calculations. And uh, all the effects you mentioned have to be taken into account. And I think they will lead to corrections to all of these things that I showed you. Uh, interested in knowing if polarons are eigenstates of the system. Uh, in particular, I'm wondering if they are a good starting point for perturbation theory. So, polarons are functions. If they're a good starting point for perturbation theory for calculations of like optics, for example. Uh, so, they are not. So, you know, this is uh, connected to the previous question. So, in DFT, we talk about eigenstates at fixed. Uh, atomic positions, okay? So the atomic positions are, are a parameter. And then there are against states like the Kohn-Sharming states. So in this case, it is also true. So you have uh, Kohn-Sharming states for displaced atoms, uh, uh, but they're not against states of the many body electron phonon system in practice, okay? So there is this, uh, this is a limitation DFT where essentially the atoms have been thrown away, kept frozen, and then you do the electrons. And now we're saying that they're to be brought together uh, back, but they're still classical particles. So they cannot be described as against states. So the best that one could do is to go back to Green's function methods and see them as quasi-particle excitations in practice. But there are still some challenges there because even with Green's function, there is a little bit of a separation between the electrons and, 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 the, and the nuclei. So this is something that, uh, so one could address either by describing the complete wave functions of electrons and atomic positions, which nobody has ever done because it's complicated, uh, or by uh, trying to, study the excitations and for specific probes, like for example, vibration spectroscopy or for the electron spectroscopy. But I'm, I don't think one can still can talk about against states of the many body system as such. Thank you, Mr. Thomas. Um, I'm wondering with the ab initio boron package on the multi chloride, Yeah, that's a very good point, uh, uh, question. So what uh, 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 we know is that there are, uh, uh, I think, uh, uh, ESR measurements. Basically, they look at defects. Essentially, these are measurements that are designed to, to study defects, essentially, that see features. And the, 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 the shape of these features that they can reconstruct, they look similar to this kind of whole polar that I mentioned for lithium fluoride. But I would say that the main, I think the main target would be to try to, to, that's a bit of a long shot, but to, to try to reproduce the transport measurements. That would be the, really the, a good way to validate all these things. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for your uh, next talk. So you showed us for many materials the copying uh, constant would be quite simple, right? So that's because of the, uh, 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 I mean, the, the, the biggest uh, uh, 
the helicopter is the visual rider in front right yeah so this one is the uh, uh, the laser release to the green effect so so the so the last I mean, this is even the cutting constant, so yeah. it's quite different. Yeah, yeah. So, material. so this has to do mostly with this. Yeah, yeah. So this is basically the fact that this uh, uh, epsilon naught is much larger as you go this way. So, 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 so if the system is more ionic, uh, so the, yes. the screen is moving, yeah. smaller, so then the cutting constant is stronger. Yeah. Also, for the ionic system, so. Also, the um, the, the bandwidth strength is usually uh, the number small is detectable. So the, the bandwidth can say something. The bandwidth strength is also uh, welcome to say you or. Uh, so we haven't looked at that. So I think one could uh, possibly perform this calculation using one watts correction. The issue is that uh, basically in practice, the so in terms of uh, Methodology, you are we are bound to use uh, matrix elements that we can calculate, and at this point, uh, we can only calculate reasonably, uh, you know, using standard functionals essentially, like local or semi local functions, right? So, in principle, one could go to more complex functions, but in practice, we cannot do it now, okay? So, I think this would take a few years to, to so that's a more general question can one uh, work with advanced functionals? In electron four interactions, I think this is desirable, but it's not yet possible. One last question. Thank you for the great talk. In the picture of the polar that I showed for uh, this in chloride, the electron polar over the gas light is the, the same of the polar is like a spherical, uh, but the whole polar is like P light. So, does this mean that the shape of the polar has any connection with the orbital function of the band? Oh yeah, yeah. So this is actually the the precisely. So the uh, well, I mean, you can see from. So the the problem it draws weight from some states, and if you look at the at the decomposition, uh, for example, the electron polaron, the states are mostly you know the conduction on bottom and nearby. So the character of this function is reflected into the shape of the polaron, which is actually in that case S S type orbitals. And the same goes for the, I didn't show this, this one for the valence, but it's exactly that, that you also pick up essentially the p-types orbitals of the uh, valence band. So this is, yeah, it's like when you talk about the one-year functions, okay? So they, they inherit the chemistry of, of your compound, okay? All right. Yeah, so basically what I'm trying to say, so imagine, uh, so this plot is imagine a zoom of a parabola that goes very far down, okay, and goes up the other side, right? That basically the Fermi level, imagine it's uh, maybe 20 times the foreign energy, right? So what is going to happen? So if I were to show the entire band structure, so there would be the other branch, right? So the other side. So the other side would have a kink like that, but show it this way, right? Does it make sense? So this is basically one. So you have a parabola. So there's only one side. So if you look at the other side, that I'm not showing here, there would be the kink also towards the center, right? And then when you when you when when these things are very close because the Fermi is, is nearby, essentially they, they merge together and they close. Does that make sense? So, so I'm saying basically it's uh, something like that. Then if you instead have something like this, you have something like that, something like that. So they close here, and this spills a little bit of charge down here. Is that does that make sense? Correct. But if you have, for instance, you would have the scenario of the same thing, you think yeah. of the same velocity, that's right, or the same polar length, or the same satellite. Well, yeah, 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 yeah. No, no. So this basically, actually, this is a. a, a, a if you go to this uh, uh, review article, this is a model that you can solve uh, literally by hand in you know ten minutes. And if if you plot these things, you you will see that as the Fermi level. So with the same level of theory, so just a second order perturbation theory. 
uh, as the Fermi level uh, approaches the foreign energy, these two sides basically merge into one and there is a bit of uh, transfer of spectral weight below. So that's, uh, I'm not saying it is the full picture, I'm just saying this is the, the beginning of the emergence of a satellite below that, okay? Uh, and, you know, when you mention strong coupling, one has to essentially, clearly this does not have multiple satellites. To see those, one has to use maybe the cumulant or things like that. So this is just to say that there is a hint of the existence of the satellites already in the kind of picture we saw on Tuesday. Well, that's a million dollar question. I guess it's the, the so there is a, a, a several uh, uh, groups have been pushing the, proposing that Cooper pairs could be, could exist in the form of bipolarons. So two polarons forming a, 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 you know, essentially a single entity. There is something called the bipolar on theory of high temperature superconductivity. Uh, so these things are all, uh, they have to be tested. And this is something very beautiful. It just, at least from the point of view of initial calculation, it would be very difficult, but it's something which certainly would be worth uh, uh, looking into. Yeah. Okay, I think we need to stop here. Of course, this is a very interesting topic. And so we can move around.